You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner, number 175, entitled Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, Human Life in a Cosmic Context, translated by Simon Blacksland de Lange. This is the 17th lecture of 17, so it's the end of the book, last lecture, lecture 17, given in Berlin on the 8th of May, 1917. It might well seem as though in the period following the mystery of Golgotha, no rays of spiritual enlightenment were streaming toward mankind. And there could be every reason to think that a situation of this kind was the generally prevailing condition of humanity, and increasingly so as we come closer to our own times. This is actually not the case. And if we want to have a clear oversight of these matters, We need to make a distinction between what is common to all mankind and what takes place in particular pockets of human life, and in such a way that it can be discerned in the most diverse areas of life. It would be discouraging for many people today if they were obliged to be constantly saying to themselves, yes, we are being told about the spiritual world, but the paths to this spiritual world are closed to people today. There are many at this present time who come to this discouraging conclusion. But such a conclusion arises from the fact that they do not have the greater courage to make an unqualified commitment where clear paths open up into the spiritual world. And they also lack the courage to make an objective judgment in this domain. It may therefore seem, and I emphasize that this is only apparently so, that we are today very far removed from those times when the spiritual world was to a certain extent open to the whole of mankind through atavistic clairvoyance, or from those later times when it could be opened up to individuals through initiation into the mysteries. We need to draw together certain threads, which connect former periods of human evolution with the present, if we are to be able to arrive at a full understanding of the mysteries of human existence, and in particular of such phenomena as we have been speaking about in these lectures in connection with the nature of the mysteries. I would, therefore, like to take an example from recent times, which is accessible to everyone, and which can help to give us the courage to make the resolve to seek paths leading to the spiritual world. Out of the plenitude of examples that I could have chosen, I should like to select one where we can see immediately how phenomena such as these are misjudged from a materialistic standpoint in our present age, and I am aware will continue to be so misjudged. You will all have heard something about the poet Otto Ludwig, who was born in the same year as Hebel and Richard Wagner, 1813. Otto Ludwig was not only a poet, uh, and one may even be of the opinion that he wasn't a very good poet, although that is of no importance in the present context, close parenthesis, but he was a man who had been much concerned with self-observation, who sought self-knowledge, and who also succeeded in penetrating beyond the veil that for the majority of people in our time enshrouds their inner life. Otto Ludwig describes very beautifully what he observes when he is writing poems of his own or when he is reading other people's poetry and is relishing its effect. He concludes that he does not read or compose in the way that other people do, but that something very powerful begins to stir within him, both when he is engaged in composition and when he is reading and allowing the effect of other poetry to work upon him. He describes this very beautifully. 
I want to read you this passage because you can discern in it a piece of self-knowledge of a thoroughly contemporary man who died only in the second half of the 19th century and who, as he imparts the self-knowledge that he has acquired, speaks of things that our present materialistic age regards as the wildest fantasy. But Otto Ludwig was no dreamer. He did have a tendency to brood, but anyone who experiences the effect of his poetry will be aware that there was something thoroughly sane and balanced about this man. This is how he describes his inner experiences when he is either composing his own poems or reading the poetry of others. Quote, the first thing that I experience is a musical mood which becomes a color. Then I see figures, one or several, adopting particular positions and gestures, either on their own or facing one another, rather like a copper plate engraving on paper of the particular color in question, or, to be more precise, like a marble statue or sculptural group on which the sun falls through a veil of that same color. I also experience this phenomenon of color when I have read poetry that has made a deep impression on me. If I awaken the mood that is evoked by Goethe's poems, I see a deep golden yellow that extends into golden brown, whereas with Schiller I see a, a radiant crimson, and with Shakespeare every scene is a nuance of the particular color that I associate with the whole play. Curiously enough, the image or group that I discern is not normally associated with the denouement, and sometimes there is only a characteristic figure in a melodramatic position, which is immediately joined by a whole series of other figures. To begin with, I am ignorant of the plot or the content of the story, but from the situation that I initially envisage until the end, a whole series of ever-new three-dimensional miming figures and groups flit before me until I see the whole play in all its scenes. All of this happens at a great speed and is quite a strain to take in, and a kind of physical anxiety takes hold of my hands. I am then able to reproduce at will the content of individual scenes in their sequence, but it is impossible for me to summarize the content of the story in a short narrative. The gestures then begin to be accompanied by speech. I write down what I can, but if the mood forsakes me, what I have written down is nothing but a dead letter. Now I set about filling in the gaps in the dialogue, but in order to do this, I need to view what I have already written with a critical eye. Close quote. Steiner again. Thus we have a remarkable person who, to the great distress of a modern, materialistically thinking person, experiences crimson red when reading Schiller's plays and golden yellow or golden brown when he reads Goethe's plays or poems, while with every play by Shakespeare he experiences a particular color, and with every scene a nuance of this color sensation. Moreover, when he composes or reads a poem, he sees figures that are like copper plate engravings set against a background of a particular color, or even three-dimensional miming figures illuminated by the sun through a veil which diffuses the light that is for him evocative of the overall mood. A phenomenon of this nature needs to be understood in the right way. It is not quite clairvoyant but it represents a path to spiritual vision. A right way of understanding this mood through spiritual science would be to say that Otto Ludwig certainly knows about spiritual vision. For were he to continue on this path, he would not only have such moods, but just as physical objects appear before the outward physical eye, spiritual beings would come before his spiritual eye, EYE, and would be encompassed within his inner experience. Just as we see flashes of light that seemingly radiates from our eyes and fills the room, so is it with Otto Ludwig. His soul radiated a certain inner atmosphere, consisting of moods of color and tone. As he rightly says, he experiences them first in the musical realm as tonal moods. He does not use them 
to arrive at spiritual perceptions, but we can see that he has the inner capacity to find a path to the spiritual world. It would therefore not be right to say that there are no people in modern times who are aware that what we may call the eye of the soul, EYE, what was revealed to the pupils of the mysteries in the way that I have recounted in the previous lectures, is indeed a reality. For the real purpose of these ceremonies was primarily to make the eye of the soul perceptible and to enable the human soul to be aware of its presence, again EYE that the phenomena which I have just described are not appreciated for what they really are can be seen from the observations that Gustav Freitag makes about Otto Ludwig. This is what he says, quote, The work of this writer, and indeed his whole being, was somewhat like that of an epic poet from the time when, in the early dawn of history, Figures imbued with sound and color hovered as living imaginations around the head of the poet. Close quote. Steiner again. What he says is absolutely correct, except that it does not have anything to do with writing poems. For what Otto Ludwig experienced was not only experienced in ancient times by poets, but by everyone, and in later times by those who were initiated into the mysteries irrespective of whether they were poets or not. Thus it has nothing to do with poetic inspiration. What Otto Ludwig describes can be found enshrouded within the souls not only of poets but of all human beings in a place where the eyes of present-day materialists are not able to penetrate. That Otto Ludwig was a poet has nothing to do with this phenomenon, but it is a fact that exists alongside it. One might be a far greater poet than Otto Ludwig, and what one is able to describe may remain entirely in the subconscious. It will certainly be present in the depths of the subconscious, but will not necessarily emerge. For the art of poetry, and indeed art of any kind, amounts today to something quite other than the conscious assimilating of clairvoyant impressions. Thus I wanted to mention Otto Ludwig, in order to give you an example of a man, and people of this kind are by no means rare, but are actually quite frequently encountered, who is, without doubt, on a path to the spiritual world. If one practices the exercises described in Title Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, it is not a matter of bringing something new into being, but of raising what already exists in the soul to consciousness, so that one learns to use it or apply it consciously. This is what needs to be emphasized. The problem is not so much that it is difficult to gain access today to what lives unconsciously within the soul, but rather that people are unable to summon up the courage to become involved with a quest of this nature, and that for the most part those who would willingly do so because of their cognitive and emotional needs and longings feel a certain pressure to confine their somewhat bashful acknowledgement of this to their own intimate circle, and to say nothing whatever about it when they are amongst modern intellectuals. There is, however, something to be said for the idea that what we should characterize today as the right path in this realm, perhaps because we are living since the year 1879, does not need to be followed in the same way everywhere. And if we consider the recent past, we can be aware of a high level of clairvoyant forces in many people, which, on the one hand, do not need to be fully recognized and accepted unreservedly, or, on the other hand, regarded as something dangerous and undesirable. There are, in any event, many factors that have for some time undermined the courage to acknowledge clairvoyance. And it is for this reason that Swedenborg, who has often been mentioned in your circle, has met with so strong a reception. Many people could also view him as someone who penetrated the veil and shrouding the spiritual world. Swedenborg, readers aside, I understand that the uh, pronunciation of this is somewhat to the effect of Swedenborg, Swedenborg, but I am just pronouncing it using the regular English Swedenborg, end of readers aside. Swedenborg had developed faculties 
of imaginative cognition to a high level. Anyone wishing to gain insight into the spiritual world needs to avail himself of these faculties. Although they were indispensable to him, they essentially represented a transitional stage to higher faculties of knowledge. Swedenborg's clairvoyance was strongly linked to imaginative cognition. It was only because this imaginative cognition was so powerful a force within him that he was able to make statements about the relationship of the spiritual world to the outward physical world that are highly relevant to those seeking to gain clarity about clairvoyance through particular examples. As one example of what I am referring to, I should like to indicate how Swedenborg arrived at his convictions, how he thought and felt in order to maintain his inner connection with the spiritual world. He was not prompted by egoistic motives to gain insight into the spiritual world. He was already 55 years old when the spiritual world became open to him. Thus he was a thoroughly mature man by then, and he was well grounded in an active scientific career. Swedenborg's most important scientific works are only now being published by the Stockholm Academy of Sciences in several volumes, and they contain indications that will point the way ahead for scientific endeavors for quite some time to come. But with a person such as Swedenborg, who was one of the most eminent scientists of his time, people have learned the trick of recognizing him insofar as they agree with him and dismissing him as a fool where they do not. They perform this trick with the greatest dexterity. They are oblivious to the fact that someone like Swedenborg, whose achievements in his scientific endeavors were not only on a par with all his peers, which is no mean feat, but who stood head and shoulders above all his contemporaries as a scientist, bore witness from the age of 55 onward to the reality of the spiritual world. One question that was of particular interest to Swedenborg was that of the interrelationship between the soul and the body. After his spiritual enlightenment, he wrote a very fine treatise on this theme. What he said was approximately as follows. There are only three possible ways in which one can think about the interrelationship between soul and body. One view is that the body is the decisive factor. The body is the source of these impressions. Sense impressions influence the soul, which receives these influences from the body. The soul is therefore dependent upon the body. A second view is possible according to Swedenborg, namely that the body is dependent upon the soul, for the soul is the source of spiritual impulses. It fashions the body and makes use of it in the course of life. One should not speak of a physical influence, but of a psychic influence. The third possibility, says Swedenborg, is that both body and soul work alongside one another, but not on one another, so that a higher power brings about a harmony or correspondence between them in the way that there is an agreement between two clocks, neither of which influences the other as to what is the right time. A higher influence brings about a harmony. Thus when an outward impression is made upon my senses, the soul is led to develop thoughts. But these processes are mutually independent of one another, in that a corresponding impression is made upon the soul through the senses from without. Swedenborg explains that for those who are able to perceive the spiritual world, the first and third views are impossible, as it is evident to those who are spiritually enlightened that the soul is by virtue of its inner forces related to a spiritual sun, just as the body is related to the physical sun but that everything of a physical nature is dependent on soul and spiritual factors. He is therefore speaking, in his own particular way, about that mystery which we referred to when speaking of the mysteries, as that of the Son as a spiritual being. It was this in particular that made him an opponent of Christianity, 
because the Christianity of his time wanted to deny Christ's relationship to the Son. Swedenborg restored the Son mystery through imaginative cognition, to the extent that this was possible for his time. Now I have presented you with these thoughts because I wanted to give you an idea of what was living in Swedenborg's soul as he was on the path toward attaining spiritual knowledge. He embodied the thoughts that he had formed in relation to the question to which I have briefly referred in a kind of philosophical treatise such as is written by someone who has real insights into the spiritual world as opposed to what might be written by a modern academic philosopher who has no insight into the spiritual world. At the end of this treatise, Swedenborg speaks of what he calls a vision. By this he does not mean something that he has thought out, but something that he has actually perceived and which he has beheld with his spiritual vision. Swedenborg is not shy of speaking about his spiritual visions. Thus he recounts what a particular angel said to him because he knows that this was so. He knows it just as well as someone else knows that a certain physical human being has said something or other. This is what he said, quote, I once had a vision. Three advocates of the view of physical influence, three scholastics, Aristotelians, disciples of Aristotle, appeared before me. Thus, adherence of that doctrine which says that everything streams into the soul from without through physical influence. They were on one side. On the other side there appeared three disciples of Descartes, who spoke about spiritual influences on the soul, albeit in a somewhat incoherent way. And behind them appeared disciples of Leibniz, who spoke of pre-established harmony, of the independence of body and soul, and a state of harmony created from without. Nine figures surrounded me, close quote, he said. This is what Swedenborg saw, and the radiant leaders of each group of the three figures were Leibniz, Descartes, and Aristotle. The way that he describes this vision is as if he were recounting something from everyday life. He goes on to describe how a guardian spirit rose out of the abyss with a torch in his right hand. And as he swung this torch in front of the figures, they immediately started arguing. The Aristotelians asserted the primacy of the physical influence from their particular standpoint. The followers of Descartes stood up for spiritual impulses in their particular way, and the adherents of Leibniz likewise defended their master's views. Visions of this nature have a way of going into minute details. Swedenborg goes on to say that Leibniz appeared clad in a sort of toga, the lappets were held by his disciple Wolf. Such details always appear in these visions, of which these features are very characteristic. They began disputing among themselves. The reasons were all good, for everything in the world can be defended. Then after some time the guardian spirit reappeared, but he had the torch in his left hand and lit up the backs of their heads. Then the battle really began in earnest, they said, quote, Now neither our body nor our soul can distinguish which is right. Close quote. Then they agreed to cast three slips of paper into a box. On one was written, in quotes, physical influence. On the second, in quotes, spiritual influence. And on the third, in quotes, pre-established harmony. Then they picked out one of them, and it was that which said spiritual influence and they said that they would agree to accept this. Then an angel descended from the higher worlds and said, quote, It was not purely fortuitous that you drew out the slip of paper saying spiritual influence. This choice had been anticipated by the wise spirits who guide the world, because it is the truth. Close quote. This is the substance of Swedenborg's vision. Of course, anyone is at liberty to belittle its significance or perhaps even consider it naive. But what matters is not whether it is native, but simply that this is what he experienced. Sometimes the simplest things are also the most profound. For what seems arbitrary in the physical world 
the result of fortuitous circumstances, is, when viewed from a spiritual perspective, the symbol of something altogether different. It is difficult to arrive at an understanding of chance, because chance is merely the shadow picture of higher necessities. But Swedenborg wants to indicate something quite specific, or rather not he, but in quotes, it wants to be indicated through him. He creates this picture because it wants this to happen within him. This is an exact description of the way in which he arrived at his truths, an exact description of the spirit out of which this treatise was written. What did the Cartesians do? They wanted to demonstrate the idea of spiritual influence on the basis of human reason, on intellectual grounds. It is possible to arrive at the truth by these means, but it is rather like a blind hen looking for a grain of corn. The Aristotelians are no less intelligent than the Cartesians. They defended the idea of physical influence, again on human grounds. The followers of Leibniz were certainly no dafter than the other two, but they stood for the idea of pre-established harmony. These were not the paths that Swedenborg followed to the spirit, but he used all his skill to prepare himself for receiving the truth, and his way of expressing this receiving of the truth, not establishing the truth for himself but being the recipient of it, was through this process of drawing slips of paper from a box. That is the important thing to bear in mind. We do not appreciate the true value of matters of this nature if we approach them intellectually. We only appreciate them for what they are if we view them pictorially, even if intelligent people may regard this picture language as naive. For the effect of an image or symbol is different from that of an intellectual concept in that it prepares us inwardly to receive the truth from the spiritual world. This is the essential point. And if we give proper attention to these things, we shall gradually develop a familiarity with ideas and concepts that are essential for people today, ideas which they really need to develop and which only appear to be inaccessible because of an antipathy deriving from materialism and from no other source. The main focus of our studies today has been to study human evolution as leading initially to a certain turning point in which the mystery of Golgotha falls. History then continues. Both these two phases of evolution are radically different from one another, and I have already made it sufficiently clear in what respects this is so. But it is worth considering the following in order to have a clear picture of this difference. In ancient times it was always possible that without making any particular inner preparation associated with the activity concerned, parenthesis, for in the mysteries this was associated with outer ceremonies and ritualistic acts, close parenthesis, people became convinced through these outward ceremonies of the reality of the spiritual world, and hence also of their own immortality because this was still an integral part of their bodily nature before the mystery of Golgotha. By the time of the mystery of Golgotha, it was no longer possible for the human body to exude a conviction of immortality. The body could no longer, as it were, impregnate the air around it with a living experience of this kind. This has been prepared in the centuries, this had been, prepared in the centuries before the mystery of Golgotha, and it is really extraordinarily interesting to see the way in which that giant of thinkers, Aristotle, made every effort before the mystery of Golgotha to understand the immortality of the soul, but the idea of immortality that he was able to arrive at was a very strange one. For Aristotle, man is only fully man if he has his body and Franz Brentano, one of the best Aristotelians of recent times, says in his study of Aristotle that man is not complete if he lacks any part of his being. 
How can he be fully a human being if he lacks his whole body? Thus for Aristotle, when the soul passes through the gate of death, it is of lesser stature than when it was in the body. This represents an incapacity to perceive the true nature of the soul, and it can be contrasted with the former capacity to perceive the soul in its immortal aspect. But the curious thing is that Aristotle was the leading philosopher throughout the Middle Ages. In the opinion of the scholastics, whatever can be known was known by Aristotle. And as philosophers, we cannot do other than rely on Aristotle and follow in his footsteps. There was no wish amongst them to develop spiritual faculties or spiritual forces that go beyond what was laid down by Aristotelianism. This is highly significant. It it gives some very clear insight into the fact that Julian the Apostate rejected the Christianity that had come to be practiced in the Church at the time of Constantine. Matters such as this need to be viewed in a higher light. I have also become acquainted with someone who, apart from Franz Brentano, was one of the leading Aristotelians of our present age, Vincenz Knauer, who was a Benedictine monk and whose relationship as a Catholic to Aristotle was similar to that of the scholastics. Thus, when he spoke about Aristotle, he always sought to consider what should be known about the immortality of the soul through human knowledge. Vincenz Knauer summarized his opinion in the following way, and there is much interest in this. Quote, the soul, that is, the departed human spirit, bracket hence the departed human spirit that has passed through death, close bracket, is according to Aristotle not in a more perfect state, but in a highly imperfect state that does not accord with its destiny. The image that is often used for the soul of a butterfly that after shedding its chrysalis soars into the blue ether of the sky is by no means appropriate. It is far more like a butterfly whose wings have been torn from it by a cruel hand and now crawls helplessly in the dust in the form of a miserable worm. Close quote. It is highly significant that those who are well familiar with Aristotle readily admit that human knowledge cannot do other than arrive at a recognition of this kind. One can therefore see that a certain effort needs to be made to resist what has arisen from this line of development. For as I have often pointed out, modern materialism is unwittingly wholly under the influence of the abolition of the spirit, which came about through the Council of Constantinople in 869 when there was no longer a wish to view man as consisting of body, soul, and spirit, but when, with the abolition of the spirit, man was left with a residue of a body and a soul. Modern materialism is now going beyond this, for it is also abolishing the soul. But this is a closely related process. A certain strength and courage are therefore needed in order to find our way back again, and moreover in the right way. Now Julian the Apostate, who was initiated into the Eloicinian mysteries, was aware that through a certain measure of soul development it would be possible to come to a recognition of the immortal nature of the soul. He had a knowledge of this sun mystery, and now from this source he perceived something that filled him with dread. He was unable to understand that what was for him so fearful an experience was a necessity. What did he actually see? When he looked back to ancient times, he saw that human beings were either directly or indirectly, through the mysteries, under the guidance of super-earthly powers, beings, and forces. He saw that what was ordained by spiritual spheres was enacted here on earth through the knowledge that human beings derive from these same spheres. And then he saw that through the impulse of Constantine, Christianity had taken on that form which the old principles of the Imperium Romanum had applied to its organization and to Christian society, that Christianity had adopted what the Imperium Romanum had developed 
purely for the outward social order. He could see this. In a certain sense, he saw the divine spiritual world harnessed to the yoke of Rome. This was what he found so terrible. He was unable to accept that if he could but see this, such a situation was necessary for a while, and this was the basis of his opposition to what was going on in the historical circumstances in which he lived. As I have already emphasized, we need to be fully aware of the great period of the early stages of Christianity before the age of Constantine. For powerful impulses were at work at this time, which were obscured through the free human quest for knowledge under the influence of the Christ impulse being harnessed to the decrees of the councils. If we go back to Origen or Clement of Alexandria, we find that these teachers were open-minded and had something of a Greek spirit. And yet they also had an awareness of the greatness of what had taken place through the mystery of Golgotha. But the way that they speak about the mystery of Golgotha and about what has occurred as a result of it is regarded as heretical today by all Christian denominations. The great church fathers of the period before Constantine are really regarded as the most outrageous heretics, even though they are recognized by the church. For however much they were aware of the great significance of the mystery of Golgotha for earthly evolution, they had no intention of wanting to eradicate all traces of the path to the mystery of Golgotha, the path of the mysteries and ancient clairvoyance, as the Christianity of Constantine was determined to do, as we have seen. Especially in the case of Clement of Alexandria, we can see how his writings are irradiated with great mysteries, whose occult nature is such that it is difficult for someone today to make any sense of them. Clement of Alexandria speaks, for example, about the Logos, about the wisdom that streams and surges through the world. He conceives of this Logos as a music of the spheres that is deeply imbued with meaning. He imagines this in a very living way. And the way that he thinks of the outward visible world is that it is in a certain sense the expression of the music of the spheres, just as the visible vibration of the strings of a musical instrument is the outward manifestation of the oscillation of sound waves. Thus, for Clement of Alexandria, the human form is a visible likeness of the Logos, We see then that as Clement of Alexandria looks up to the Logos, the human form becomes for him a confluence of tones from the music of the spheres. Man, he says, is an image of the Logos. And in many of Clement's utterances we find traces of a sublime wisdom that dwelt within him, a wisdom that was irradiated by what flows from the mystery of Golgotha. If you compare what Clement of Alexandria says with the things that are generally said today, you will become strongly aware of the need to recognize a person such as Clement of Alexandria, even if you do not understand him. When it is said that spiritual science seeks to live wholly within the stream of Christianity, and that it is necessary for our time that it blossoms forth from this foundation as a new flowering, many people come and say, parenthesis, and I well know that this is so, close parenthesis, that it is a revival of the ancient Gnosis. And at the very mention of this word, many professing Christians today cross themselves as if the devil himself were at large. The modern form of Gnosis is indeed spiritual science. Though this modern Gnosis is different from the Gnosis that Clement of Alexandria was familiar with. But what does Clement of Alexandria say from his vantage point in the second half of the second century AD? He says that faith is the basis from which we proceed. A modern churchgoer does not want to go beyond this. Clement, however, goes on to say that while faith is already knowledge, the concise knowledge of what is needed 
The gnosis confirms and reinforces what has been received through faith. It is founded upon faith through our Lord's teachings and develops this faith to the point of scientific irrefutability and clarity. Clement expresses in his own way, for his time, what needs to become a reality today. A demand of Christianity is here being expressed that gnosis in the form of modern spiritual science must contribute actively to the development of Christianity. The conventional view today is that on the one side there is science, which is confined to outer facts, and faith on the other. Clement of Alexandria says that to faith is added gnosis, to gnosis love, and to love the kingdom of the the kingdom, or the divine inheritance. This is one of the most profound things that have been said by anyone, because it testifies to a deep bond with the life of the Spirit. We begin with faith, but gnosis, that is, knowledge or understanding, is added to it. And out of a living knowledge, that is, from entering deeply into actual realities, there emanates a genuine love. And this love is the bearer of our divine inheritance. The divine world can only stream through humanity in the way that it did in ancient times if gnosis is added to faith. Love to gnosis and the kingdom, our divine inheritance, to love. Such utterances as these need to be viewed in such a way that one can see them as a testimony to the profundity of a thinker such as Clement. Although on the one hand it is difficult, it is on the other hand necessary to make the true form of Christian life accessible once more to human beings. For if certain phenomena are described in the right way, the real source of our present afflictions will become apparent. It is the case with afflictions of this nature that one does not normally perceive what lies at the bottom of them. Thus when an alpine village is buried beneath an avalanche, everyone sees the avalanche plunge down to the village. But anyone looking for what caused the avalanche may need to examine what was going on far above in a tiny snow crystal. It is easy to observe the destruction of the village by the avalanche. It is not so easy to state that in purely physical terms it may perhaps have been caused by a crystal of snow we have a comparable situation with the great events of world history. We can see perfectly well that we are caught up in a terrible catastrophe, which is like an avalanche that has descended upon us. Its origins are to be sought in a place equivalent to where the crystal began to move. We shall need to look for several different crystals, but we tend not to pursue our investigations to the point where a potential cause develops into an actual one. We are reluctant today to see certain things for what they really are. Let us suppose that someone wants to form a judgment as to what constitutes science in a particular field. How, generally speaking, is this done? He relies on the judgment of an expert in that subject. Why is the judgment authoritative? because the person concerned has the title of professor at this or that university. That is generally the reason why something or other is recognized today as being scientific. But let us take an actual instance. I know very well that people do not appreciate it if one speaks directly about certain things, but this does not get us very far, and indeed unless more and more people can penetrate to the truth of the matter, we shall never extricate ourselves from our present predicaments. Let us suppose that one of these great authorities says something along these lines, People are constantly talking about man having a body and a soul. This dualism of body and soul is fundamentally unsatisfactory. The only reason that we will speak about body and soul today is that we have to express ourselves through language, and we did not create our languages but inherited them from an earlier time when people were far more stupid than modern university professors. These stupid people still believed in the soul as distinct from the body. 
And when we speak about these matters today, we have to make use of these words. We are the slaves of language, and through language of the stupid people who were not blessed with clever professors like us. Close quote. And he continues, quote, Thus we have to speak of body and soul, but there is no justification for doing so. For anyone speaking from a modern standpoint and without being misled by the views of former times may perhaps say, subquote, Here I see a flower and here I can see another human being. I can see the other person's form and complexion just as I see the flower. Everything else I have to deduce for myself. Close subquote. But that is pure illusion. What I really receive when I experience a flower or a stone is a sense impression. The notion that something is living in the soul is a pure illusion. Nothing exists other than external relationships. Close full quote. Steiner again. You will be saying to yourselves that you cannot make head or tail of all this. Well, it is a good thing if you can make very little of it, for the whole argument is utter nonsense and the height of folly. And yet this crass stupidity is associated with all sorts of painstaking investigations undertaken in laboratories about the human brain, about all manner of clinical findings, and so on. This means that the person concerned must be a fool. He is in a position to acquire good clinical results because he has laboratories at his disposal. But what he says about it all is the purest folly. These fools are no rarity nowadays, and indeed they represent a norm. Of course, I do not make myself popular by saying such things. The lecture series, which has been published in book form by the man in question, curiously his name is Fevorn, though of course I must regard this as the chance legacy of physical circumstances, is entitled The Mechanism of Spiritual Life. One might equally well write about the woodenness of iron as about the mechanism of spiritual life. Indeed, if our intellectual life is in its most enlightened representatives imbued with such, quote, acuity of thinking, close quote, after all, Favorn describes what he sees, but he muddles everything with his own somewhat inane thoughts. We should not be surprised if those disciplines which do not have the fortune to have at least some bearing upon reality in the sense-perceptible world, and lack a tangible external content, are completely unable to cope. Especially the political sciences, which lack the crutch of outward facts, would need to develop thoughts that are rooted in reality. But for the reasons that I have indicated in my previous lecture, they are bereft of such thoughts. People have to have these things spelt out to them, I referred earlier on I referred earlier on to a very capable person, the Swedish thinker Kellen, who in many ways is quite outstanding. His book, The State as Organism, is of high quality. But toward the end he presents a remarkable view excuse me, a remarkable idea which does not lead him anywhere, but which no one else knows what to do with either. He quotes a certain Fustel del Collanges who wrote La Cité Antique and who points out in his book something which for him is quite remarkable, namely that if one studies pre-Christian social and political institutions, one finds that virtually everything in the entire organization is based on ritual, on a social foundation of a spiritual nature. So you see, people are forced to encounter certain facts. For I already told you in my previous lecture how the social order arose from the mysteries and really had a spiritual foundation. When people study these historical phenomena, they encounter certain things, but they are unable to understand them and are at a loss to know how to relate to them. They can make nothing of what even history tells them when there is so little documentary evidence to rely on. Still less are they able to make anything of the other idea that needs to be revived, an idea which we find in the mysteries and as a miraculous echo of the mysteries in Plato and which I referred to as a new path to Christ. 
If you read the works of Plato, you become aware of something quite remarkable. Plato places Socrates at the focal point of his dialogues. Socrates, surrounded by his pupils. And what he wants to say is set within the framework of the conversation that he has with them. In his writings, Plato forms a connection with Socrates after his death. This is more than a mere literary device. It is, I would say, the continuation, the echo of what was practiced in the mysteries when the neophytes were guided toward communion with the dead who continue to rule over the outer sense-perceptible world from the world of the spirit. Plato develops his philosophy through his connection with the dead Socrates. This idea must be revived. It needs to become possible again. And I have already indicated how it can be done. We must find a way of reaching beyond a dry study of history, beyond the mere relating of outer events. We must be able to live with the dead and make it possible for the thoughts of the dead to arise once more within us. We must, in this sense, be able to take the idea of resurrection seriously. This is the path through which Christ reveals himself in our inner soul experience, the path whereby he can demonstrate his true nature. But one aspect of this path is the development of what can be called the will in thinking. If you are only able to develop the kind of thoughts that you have when you perceive the sense-perceptible world, you will not engender thoughts that can truly relate to the dead. We need to acquire the capacity to derive thoughts directly from our own being. Our will must have the courage to unite with reality. And once it has become spiritualized in this way, it will encounter spiritual beings, just as your hand encounters physical objects in the sense-perceptible world. And the first spiritual beings that we generally encounter are those dead people with whom we are in some way karmically connected. However, where these matters are concerned, you should not be looking for the kind of guidance that can be written on a slip of paper and put in your waistcoat pocket. These things are not as simple as that. One encounters well-meaning people who ask, quote, How can I distinguish between dream and reality? Close quote. One should not be aiming to apply a fixed rule to making this distinction in any particular case. One's whole soul should gradually become attuned to making a judgment in the individual case, just as in the sense-perceptible world one seeks to make a judgment about any specific instance. A dream may be very similar to having contact with reality, but one cannot in any particular instance state absolutely that this is how you distinguish between a mere dream and reality. It can even happen that what I am saying now is erroneous in certain specific cases, because other points of view need to be considered. The point is that one should always try to exercise a competence in making judgments about the spiritual world within the entirety of one's soul. Let us take the very familiar case of someone who is dreaming or thinks he is dreaming, but people cannot so easily distinguish between dream and reality. Those who study dreams today think along the lines of people like Herr Favon, who opts for an instructive experiment, and he gives the following experiment as an interesting example. Someone is dreaming, and someone else goes up to the window with a pin and taps on the window pane. A sleeping person dreams, wakes up, and says that he has heard rifle fire. According to Favon, the dream exaggerates everything. How can we explain this? We explain this, says Favorn, by acknowledging that in waking consciousness our brain is fully active. In dream consciousness the brain is in a diminished state of activity and only a peripheral consciousness is active. The cerebral cortex is not involved and the brain's activity is at its least intense. This is why the dream is so bizarre. This is why the tapping of the pins becomes rifle fire and why through the brain's activity the faint sounds of the pin are turned into a gun battle. Well, the members of the reading public are being innocently led up the garden path. 
because in one passage they are told that the dream exaggerates everything, and later on, not in the precise words that I have used, they are told that the brain is less active, which is why the dreams appear bizarre. And by then the reader has already forgotten what was previously said. He therefore does not connect the two statements. His sole need is to believe that a person of authority who has been appointed by the state to know these things is saying this, and so he has to believe it. Now, as you know, belief in authority is currently taboo. Someone who does not think in this way about the dream may say the following, which could well be the right approach. Let us suppose that you dream of a friend who has died. You dream or believe you are dreaming that you share that you are sharing a situation with this friend and then you wake up. Your first thought on waking is, of course, that he died long ago. But it did not occur to you in your dream that he was dead. Now you can find all sorts of clever explanations for the dream in Favorin's book. But if this is a dream, and the dream is not a recollection of everyday life, you will find it, it difficult to understand that the most prominent thought in your mind, namely the fact of your friend's death, plays no part in the dream when you have just been experiencing a situation which you know perfectly well you could not have been sharing with a living person. It would then be appropriate to say, I have now been experiencing something with X that I could not have experienced in life, something that I not only did not experience, but in terms of the relationship that I had with him, I could not have experienced, and yet I am now experiencing it. You may assume that the actual soul that has passed through the portal of death is behind this dream picture. It is, after all, clear enough that you are not sharing in his death experience. The soul has no reason to manifest itself to you as dead, since it lives on. If you take these two factors into consideration, perhaps connect them with something else, you will conclude that behind my image is concealed an actual meeting with the soul of this friend. And the reason why the thought of death does not occur to me is that I am not experiencing a recollection, but the person who has died is drawing near to me. I am now experiencing something that is clothed in the form of a dream picture, but the situation that is portrayed could not have existed. Moreover, I do not think of death because there is no reason for the thought of death to be evoked. You have every reason for saying that when you have a dream of this kind, you are dwelling in a region where physical memory plays no part. And what I am saying now is extremely important, for it is a particular characteristic of our physical life that our physical memory remains intact. This kind of memory does not exist to the same extent or in a similar way in the world of the spirit which we enter. And we first have to develop the kind of memory which is necessary there. Physical memory is wedded to the physical body. Anyone who is familiar with this region knows that the physical memory does not extend there. It is not surprising that we are concerned not with a memory of the dead person, but with a meeting with his living soul. Those who are familiar with this say that what we call memory is physical in physical life is something completely different in spiritual life. Anyone who has experienced Dante's great imagination of the Divine Comedy will, if he has some understanding of it, have no doubt that Dante had visions, that he was familiar with the spiritual world. Those who know the language of those people who were familiar with the spiritual world, will find convincing proof in the introduction that Dante wrote for his Commedia. But Dante had knowledge of spiritual matters. He was no dilettante in the affairs of the spirit and was something of an expert in this field. He was someone who knew that ordinary memory does not extend to that sphere where we encounter the dead. Dante speaks much about the dead and about how the dead live in the light of the spiritual world. You can find these beautiful words in his great poem about memory. Quote, o light supreme, by mortal thought unscanned, grant that thy former aspect may return. Once more a little of thyself 
relend. Make strong my tongue that in its words may burn one single spark of all thy glory's light for future generations to discern. For if my memory but glimpse the sight whereof these lines would now a little say, may, men may the better estimate thy might. Close quote. Steiner again. Thus you can see that Dante knew that it is not possible to understand what could derive from spiritual realms with ordinary faculties of memory. Many people today ask why we should aspire to the spiritual world when we have quite enough to do here in the physical world. Anyone with any competence will want to focus on coping with the problems of this world. Yes, indeed. But are these people entitled to believe that those who were initiated into the mysteries in ancient times were any less prepared to do the physical world justice? After all, they knew that the spiritual world exerts an influence upon the physical world and that one only creates confusion with these denials. Anyone who rejects the idea that those who have passed through the portal of death exert an influence upon this world is like a person who says that he doesn't believe it when he is told that a surface is hot and then burns himself on a hot plate. It is, of course, not so easy to demonstrate the harm that is caused if there is no awareness of the influence of the spiritual world upon the physical world, and if people act on the basis that it is possible to ignore this influence. Our age is little inclined to build the bridge that must be built in order to reach that kingdom where the dead and the higher beings dwell. In many respects it even has a hatred, a really hateful attitude toward the spiritual world, and the spiritual scientist who seeks to approach these matters with honesty is obliged to draw attention to forces that are hostile to the development of anthroposophy. But there are profound reasons for this hostility, and they are the same reasons which underlie all the forces seeking to oppose the true progress of humanity in our time. And that is the end of, it, lec of Lecture 17 of the 17 lectures of this collected volume 175 entitled Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, Human Life in a Cosmic Context. 17 lectures given in Berlin between the 6th of February and the 8th of May, 1917. Translated by Simon Blaxland Delane.